Hi, I'm Peter Saffin, the CEO of the Mathematical Association of Victoria, and I'm here to tell you a bit more about our VC revision program. Each year, MAV produces a very successful VC revision package for students in methods, specialist and further mathematics. Our program is self-paced, interactive and delivered online through our learning management system. This program has received extremely incredible feedback and is jam-packed with useful information, advice, hints and tips for exam success. Never before have we offered so much value in our VCE program. All courses are delivered, including videos by experienced teachers who are VCAA exam assessors. This means that the information students receive will be the most relevant and up-to-date. The tips are based on where students typically make mistakes in the VCE exams. Furthermore, the courses feature technology videos created by TI and Casio experts to support all students. Here are my top five inclusions. Three to six hours of video content in each course. You'll get to hear where students go wrong. You'll get loads of common exam questions explained and how to solve them. And insights into the VCAA maths exam and how to smash it. Two, you'll get videos from TI Inspire and Casio experts showing you how to solve efficiently and effectively using CAS technologies. Three, you receive a comprehensive book of revision notes, including tips for exam success tricky past exam questions with solutions. Four, assess your understanding with interactive multiple choice quizzes throughout using actual past exam questions and MAV practice exam questions. Five, attend exclusive live webinars with the VCAA assessors where you'll get to ask them questions in real time. We hope you enjoy this program. We know it'll help you. Have a look on our website and see what you think but it's definitely something you need to do your best in VCE. Welcome to the Further Mathematics, um, our revision program here. We're going to obviously speak you through a few of the tips and tricks that should help you with your Further Maths exam. Um, as just an overall, and then we'll also be going through all of the modules and looking at lots of exam questions in more detail. So the first part is, is my name is Jessica Mount. I will be doing half of the course with you. So I'll be doing the networks module, the geometry module and the graphs and relations module. Um, I have taught so further maths for the last nine, nine to 10 years, and I've been a VCAR assessor for the same, the same amount, amount of time. time. And, and I'm also, also an education consultant with the Maths Association of Victoria. And I'm Christine Utba. I'm a further maths teacher as well, same as Jess. I've been teaching further maths since 2006, which was my first year of teaching, and I've been teaching it every year since. I've also been a VCAR assessor since 2007, in my second year of teaching. Um, I've been working for MAV for quite a while, doing these revision lectures and other projects as well. And I'm currently a head of maths down on the beautiful Mornington Peninsula. So I'm just going to give you a brief overview of what this session is going to be about or this online program. So it starts with videos of important past exam questions, things that we've found in the examiner's report that are going to be useful for you because students perhaps haven't answered them well or are things that are appearing year after year. And then we group them into small concepts together and then you'll get some time to practice some sample exam questions. It isn't a summary of the course. It is not us reteaching you what you have learnt throughout the year. It is not a textbook style review. It is analysis of difficult exam questions. So we're going to be going over the things that students are finding really tricky year after year and helping you move your results higher. The exam specifications. Each exam is 15 minutes reading time and an hour and 30 minutes writing time. You are allowed your CAS calculator and your bound summary reference in each of the exams. And you're also provided with a formula sheet. So make sure that you know exactly what's on that formula sheet. Most of the time, if you've got your bound summary reference set up properly, then you won't need to look at the formula sheet, but check that you've got everything, get a past year's exam, check that everything on that formula sheet is in your bound summary reference. 
33% is what each exam is worth and that goes towards your study score. So 33% for exam one, 33% for exam two, and then all of your SACs have contributed 34%. Examination one is about facts, skills and applications. There are 40 multiple choice questions, each worth one mark. Some are more difficult than others. They're not weighted in a way that gives you more for the difficult questions. They are each worth just one mark. The way that it is um, split, 16 questions for data analysis, the core, and eight questions for the core recursion and financial modeling. And then there are eight questions for your selected modules. So you'll be doing two selected modules out of the total of the four and eight questions for each of those, giving a total of 40 multiple choice questions. 90 minutes writing time to do that, when you work it out, ends up being about 2.25 minutes per question. So use that as a guide when you're doing your practice exams, you don't have to sit down and do a whole paper worth 40 multiple choice marks. Maybe you're going to do 10, so take your 2.25 minutes and times it by 10 and try and work under those time constraints. For exam one, you need to know the name and number of the modules that you have studied. So if you've studied matrices, that's module one. So no module one matrices, you have to mark that on your multiple choice sheet. Clearly mark an answer for every single question. Okay, make sure you don't have two on the same line. Make sure you're not missing one. You're not penalized for wrong answers. So obviously you don't get the mark if you get it wrong, but you're not penalized, it's not minus one. So answer everything. Make sure, as I said a moment ago, that there's one selection for each question. It can be difficult sometimes when you're working really quickly to try and make sure that you've got one on each line. Be careful you haven't put an A and an E on the same line and then missed the next one. Make sure you answer everything and guess some if you need to. Educated guess, and I'll show you how we can educate, do an educated guess with some of them. That might mean just getting rid of a couple of the options, but make an educated guess on some of the questions if needed. Make sure you've answered everything. Spend time on what you do know and do it well. As I said before, one mark for each question. So if you're spending a lot of time on those harder questions at the end of a module, then you might not get to some of the ones that you find a bit easier at the start of the next module. So make sure that you are going and spending time on what you do know and do it well might mean that you have to leave some of the later questions in some of the modules and guess them rather than um, wasting marks that you could really get at the start of the next module. The first third of each section is relatively straightforward. The second third is a bit harder and requires a few steps to come to your final answer. And the final third is really difficult and will require careful analysis. So having a look at examination two, this is obviously your, your short answer paper where you'll have your 60 marks of your short answer questions. You've got your 24 with your data analysis, your 12 questions for recursion and financial and then you've got your 12 questions for whatever modules you do. So that might be your matrices, your networks, your geometry, or your graphs and relations. You've got the same amount of time as you do with exam one. You've got your 90 minutes of writing time. So if we're, if we're looking at averaging it out, you'd be wanting to spend about one and a half minutes on each of your questions. So obviously with exam two, you only need to answer the modules that you've actually learnt. So therefore, you'll be leaving out a few of the modules at the end, as that will depend on what you've learned at school. You need to make sure that you write your answers in the spaces that are provided. Um, there will be a box on the page and it will ask you to write inside the box. If you run out of room um, and you don't have any, any blank pages that you can go to or anything like that, then obviously ask your assessor. Spend time, obviously, on what you do know and do it well. So go through the entire exam in reading time, have a look at the modules or the questions that you think you really like and that you think you're confident with that and answer those ones first. And then you can come back if you have time to answer the other things. Usually what happens in the modules is the questions are easier at, at, at the beginning and become harder throughout the module. Therefore, you might even choose to answer the beginning of each of the modules first and then you can come back and answer the rest of it. A difficult one, might appear obviously within a module rather than at the end. So you'll need to use your reading time well to assess which questions you feel most confident with. Good preparation is essential for doing well in these examinations. 
And good preparation for maths is doing maths. You learn maths by doing maths, not by having a really beautiful summary book, but by doing the questions and then popping some of them in your summary book, but you learn it by doing it. So your bound summary reference, when? When do you do it? Now, you should be doing it if you haven't already. Don't redo it prior to the exam. You should be, it should be a work in progress throughout the year. So when I say don't redo it, don't rewrite it to make it beautiful. Okay? Add extra things into it, of course, as you come across difficult exam questions, but you don't need to redo the whole thing. What goes into a bound summary reference? Whatever you want that will help you in these exams. Formulas, obviously. Summaries, maybe you need to flesh out more what a reducing balance loan is. Worked examples are really, really important, which should make up a lot of past exam questions. How do I create a bound summary reference? You follow the rules. VCAR have got strict rules. So chat with your teacher, make sure that it's fitting the guidelines. So there's rules about being at A4, nothing folding outside the realms of the book, um, everything stuck in really well, no perforated pages. So follow the rules and make sure it is not too big as well. Having a huge, huge summary reference is not going to really be helpful if you can't find anything. So perhaps it also involves making an index page or a contents page to make sure that you can find things really quickly. The learning that you gain from creating the bound reference is just as important as the actual book itself. So what you need to be doing is making sure that you are creating it, not photocopying someone else's, not using a textbook, but making sure that it is a work of art for you, something that will help you. So to prepare for the examination, you have to revise the course thoroughly. Use the study design, use it as a checklist of your knowledge and skills. Use what we've got here as our content summaries on each of the sections as a checklist. Do I know that or maybe I need some work on it? Practice under exam conditions. Make sure your time, you're doing it under time conditions, you've got your bound reference all set up. Perhaps a mum and dad at home might put a timer on for you and tell you how much reading time or um, writing time you've got left. Make sure that under the exam conditions, you're doing exam one and exam two. Using VCAR past papers and also the Northern Hemisphere VCAR past papers are helpful. Check with your school as well, with your teacher, about practice papers. They may have purchased ones like the MAV practice papers or there are other providers who do um, write trial exams each year. So check with the school what else they've got. Use the examiner's reports. Use them really carefully to guide your solutions. Close enough isn't good enough. So if they've got a specific wording, getting it close-ish isn't really good enough. You've got to make sure that you're really harsh with your marking. Again, take it in and ask your teacher, do you think this is what they are meaning here? Look at all the answers, or look at all the questions that are answered poorly. They're likely to appear in a similar format again. And that's part of what we're doing in this session too. Read the general comments. They have a lot of general comments about rounding, about inappropriate answers. There's a lot of those at the beginning of the examiner's reports and we've summarised some in our booklet for this. Get a game plan. Make sure that you have a game plan that works for you. And by a game plan, I mean, do you want to go in and do the exam from data to recursion to your first module to your second module, the way that you've learnt it at school? Do you want to do the modules first because you find those a little bit easier? Do you want to do the first five questions first because they're, they're your certainties and then do the rest later? So come up with a game plan that is going to work for you and use it when you're doing your practice. So looking at the examination day, obviously you've got exam one and exam two, therefore they will be spread over. It's usually a Friday and a Monday. Make sure that you've got your calculator either recharged or with new batteries and that you've got it on the right float, that you've got the maximum amount of decimal places that can be seen. Um, and don't obviously lend it and let anybody else use it during this time. I would recommend that just because if they change your settings or anything like that and all of a sudden you walk in and it's not quite how you need it, make sure that you've got it all ready for you and that you are confident that it's how you need it. With the exam, obviously arrive early. You don't want to be rushed or late or anything like that. And make sure you've got everything that you need. So your pens, your pencils, your highlighters, etc. You will need a ruler. There will be perhaps a few lines that you'll need to obviously draw here and there. You'll need your bound notes and you'll obviously need your calculator. 
Now we're going to talk about some specific examination advice and I like to call them the three R's. So we've got reading as one of them. Make sure you read the question, then you read the question, and then you read the question again. By that, read the question during reading time. You're going to be a little bit nervous, so read it as many times as you can during reading time. So read it once, in multiple choice you might only get through the booklet once, but in, in exam two you might get through it a couple of times. So read it during reading time. And then read it again prior to starting your solution in writing time. Don't just rely on what you've remembered from reading time. Go back and read it again when it's writing time. And that way you can highlight some key uh, rounding, key terms, and then really get into the question. And then read the question again after you've finished your solution. So once you've written your answer down, go back and read it. Have I actually answered it properly? You need to be asking yourself these three things during that reading time. Is my answer relevant? Have I answered it? Is it reasonable? And have I correctly rounded? So I'm going to go into a little bit more detail about what those mean now. So relevance. Reread the question to ensure relevance. Have I given exactly what the question is asking? If they are asking for interest, have I given that or have I given the total amount of the loan? Have I given too much information? They're asking me just for the slope. Have I given that? Or have I given the entire equation of the regression line? Or is there not enough information? So is it relevant? Have I contradicted myself? Have I said something that perhaps when I'm writing out one of those big questions about associations, have I contradicted myself somewhere in there? And is my final answer clear? Can the examiner see my final answer? So check for relevance. Have I actually answered the question and can it be seen easily? And is my answer reasonable? Does my answer make sense? If it doesn't, and I'll talk about what some unreasonable answers might be in a moment, it gives you an opportunity to retry the question and go back and pick up some of those marks. Maybe you know it's an unreasonable answer, but you're not quite sure how to engage with it anymore. So highlight it and go back to it later. Examples of unreasonable answers over the years. People have given a negative interest rate. Okay, you can't have a negative interest rate. Go back and check. A caravan will depreciate by $5,000 for every kilometre it travels. It's going to drive around the corner and it's going to be worth less than what you paid for it. So make sure that it is a reasonable response. Could you have a mean surface temperature of negative 24,000 degrees? Could you have a weekly homework allocation of a negative number or 1,200 hours a week of homework? A little bit extreme. So rounding and further maths is very, very important. You need to be able to round well um, because each of the questions in your exam will ask you to round to a certain number of decimal places. I would recommend that you highlight the part in the question and that you've reread it and ensured that you have answered to obviously the right amount of decimal places. Show your full answer first and then write down the rounded version. This will just help you when you're going back and analysing at the end of the exam, you might be going back and just making sure all of your answers are correct. You can look at what the whole answer was first and then you can look if you've rounded it properly. The other thing is, is that you might be working out a few parts in one question. That you only round at the very last answer. You don't round obviously during the question. So if you have a question that says round to one decimal place, the only number you would round is the very last one, your actual answer that you need. You wouldn't round anything else. So you keep all of those and in your calculator, you can either highlight it or you can obviously use um, the pen if you've got a class card and just drag that down and keep all of the decimal places and then right at the end, once you've got your answer, that's what you round. Um, you may use the rounded version. So if in part A, you had to find a value of X and it asked you to round X, just to one decimal place, you can then use that rounded version in other questions and you can also use the unrounded version. So VCAR will have made sure that either will be okay. So you can use a rounded version if you've been asked to find that in an earlier part of the question. So never round unless the question actually asks you to. Most of the questions in recursion and financial will be to your nearest cent, which would be rounding to two decimal places. Other questions it will ask, and it will say one decimal place or nearest whole number. But if it doesn't instruct you to round, then you do not round. 
So you would need to look at your answer and obviously write down however many decimal places you see. So read the question carefully. Most of the questions will imply a rounding. They'll ask you to round to one or two or three decimal places, and therefore that's what you'll do. If it doesn't ask, and there was a question last year in the exam on 2020 that didn't ask you to round, um, and it was a nice, neat number. Um, it only had three decimal places, but it did throw lots of students because a lot of them then rounded to a whole number or one or two decimal places because the question didn't specify. If it doesn't specify, then you don't round. So rounding errors can be, um, they can help you if you've actually written down what the number is, but you need to be careful that you've actually have shown working of how you, how you got to that number. Often I hear lots of students asking, but I thought you could only lose one rounding error in each module. The only way that that will apply is if you've actually have shown all of the working, you have shown a correct number that is unrounded and then you've rounded in the next part and that's not a correct rounding. So there actually needs, there actually has to be a lot of working from you in order for that one to actually happen. So be careful with you, with you thinking, oh, I can only lose one rounding error in each part of the module. That's not entirely true you have to be showing a lot of working and that we actually have to be able to see how you've got your answer. So exam two, you use pen in exam two, which I know can be a little bit annoying, but it's because your exam is obviously on a computer and all of us are marking them on, on computers. Therefore, we don't want you using pencil because it can be hard to be obviously reading on the screen. Right within the borders of the pages, that's also important as well as your exam papers will also be uploaded onto a computer. And again, we can obviously only be having the part inside the border. So crossed out work will not be marked. If you change your mind and you want that working, then you have to write this. You have to say, please, if you can look at this working, I didn't mean to put a cross through it. That's fine, but you need to write that. And your two lots of answers won't be marked either. Therefore, if you've written X might be 3 or 3.5, even if one of those is, is correct, I can't mark either of them. There has to be one answer only. So try to write as neat as you can and make it easier for us to find your marks. When we're marking lots and lots and lots of papers, it can be really hard if we find an exam paper that's quite messy or it's hard to work out where things are going. It's a good idea to highlight answers or put a circle around them or even write numbers of 1, 2 and 3 of which way your working has gone, especially because you might have questions that you've needed more space and you might have begun your working out and then realise you needed more space and then you might have moved up the page or left of the page or down the page. As long as you've numbered them of where we need to look or you've drawn arrows, that's fine. We can work out where your marks are. So exam two, working. You will need to show some working in exam two. Um, this is obviously your short answer questions where you'll be writing down. If you are asked, to use a rule, if it says use your cosine rule or use your sine rule or use recursion, you have to use that and I should be seeing that in your working. A two mark will normally require some kind of working that we'll be looking for. A one mark, though, might also have a bit of working that you'll need to show, especially as there's lots of questions with one mark that will say use recursion to show that the second year has this amount of money in a bank account. So even though that's worth one mark, because you've got to use recursion, you'll have to show how you can use the formula to obviously get that value. There are no half marks in further at all. There are some of your method marks and consequential marks. Again, it will really depend on how much working you have shown and whether we can give you those method marks. So even though it might be a one mark, it's worth you showing your working in case you, you can get a method mark out of it. If you're putting things into the calculator, especially in the recursion module, and you might be using your finance solver, write down your values for N and I and PV and PMT and FV, um, as this can be used as working in your exams if there's a working mark, but it can also be really helpful for you to go back and check your working. So when you go back and you're not too sure if you've entered in the right values, if you can look down the values that you used, this will hopefully help you to work out if those numbers are correct. So exam two can have lots of show that type of questions. Might be saying show that X is 40. And you'll obviously need to use the other information in the question to help you obviously show that. So you have to obviously show how to get that answer. You can't use, if we're using 
my example before of x equals 40, then the answer should obviously be 40. I can't use the 40 anywhere in my working out. So after answering, read the question again. Look at the number of decimal places that you needed. Ask yourself if the number is reasonable. If you have a value that's way too big or way too little for the context of the question, then you might need to go back and have a look. Have you actually addressed the question? Have you answered it? Especially in things like your recursion module, where it might be asking you to find total amount of an investment, or it might be asking you just to find the interest that that investment has earned. Be really careful on what you have found out and whether that's your final answer, or you might need to add something or subtract something in order just to actually answer the whole question. Make sure you've done lots of, lots of prep, lots of VCAR questions that you've obviously looked at all the questions that haven't been done very well in the years before. So have a look at all of the exams up online, all of the examiner's reports um, that you have looked at everything. You've got your bound notes. You've got the questions in your bound notes that you think are helpful for you um, and make sure that that is all in your bound notes and that you are happy with everything that you've done. You've used your calculator. You know how to use the solve on that. You know how to use your graphing if you need that for your graphs module um, and that you obviously are comfortable with all of it. Learn maths by doing maths, as we've mentioned all throughout this video. Make sure that you have done lots of questions and that you have sought help for obviously any of the ones that you can't do. And we wish you lots of luck and we hope that all of the advice in the modules to come will be very helpful for all of your exams. We hope you've enjoyed the video today and that it's given you a little bit more insight into our VCA revision program. If you'd like to sign up for the program, you can go onto the MAV website and sign up using the link there. For one of the subjects, the cost is $60 and for two of the subjects, it's $100. We do also have a discount available for students who sign up with a group of more than 20. So you can ask your teacher if you'd like to inquire about that, about having a group discount. As we've mentioned, just as a small recap, you will be having access to over three hours of videos from VCAR assessors with lots of hints and tips and tricks and lots of common exam questions. There'll also be videos from the Casio experts and your TI Inspire experts on how to use the calculator. We'll also get an amazing book of revision notes and you'll get access to the live webinars at the end of the year as well. So again, if you'd like to sign up, you can go onto the website that is shown on your screen, mav.vic.edu.au and look for the link for the VCE revision program. Thanks for watching.